As I said earlier, it is um, great to be back, and uh, thank you very much for your kindnesses and your prayers over our time away. And we're very glad to be in our home church family. It's a good chance to visit other places, but it's always good to be home as well. This, um, this term, we're going to be thinking a little bit about what God says about the church, uh, what the church is, uh, why the church matters, and also what it means to be part of the church, what it means to be a church member, and why that matters as well. And we're going to be looking over these Sunday mornings at different passages from the Bible, and in uh, the following weeks that have home groups meeting, uh, we're going to pick up on what we've heard on Sundays and think about some of the applications together a little bit more. And, but that's, um, that's where we're heading over the coming weeks. I hope uh, you'll see how things fit together by the time we get to the end. Let me pray um, for us this morning and pray that we'd be ready to hear uh, what God has in store. Lord God, your word, you say, is uh, sharper than any two-edged sword and it cuts to the very core of a person. Uh, We long that today your word would cut to our very core. For your name's sake. Amen. Well, uh, it is Commissioning Sunday, uh, as we've mentioned, and our question for today is why are Christians here in the world? Uh, What is our purpose in being on the earth? Uh, There's one very big, uh, clear answer to that that the Bible gives in its general teaching. It says that Christians are, of course, to worship God. They're to worship God with the whole of their lives, all that they have, everything that they are. Uh, That's what Christians will be doing in heaven. That's the wonderful occupation of eternity. So when a person becomes a Christian, I suppose, they start following the Lord Jesus. God could just translate them straight to be with him in his presence so they can begin that uninterrupted worship. We've been thinking about that longing to be in heaven in our prayers already this morning. But as we know, God hasn't done that. And so the question is, why are Christians left here on earth? Uh, What is our purpose in being here? Now, of course, Christians do plenty of things like everybody else. We we make a living. We uh, provide for our families. We play our part in society. But none of those are the basic purpose for being in the world. Uh, Someone's described our reading this morning, these famous verses, as the job description for the church. Uh, Very famous verses called the Great Commission, coming right at the end of Matthew's Gospel. They're thrilling words. They're challenging words. And uh, they're the last or some of the last recorded words of the Lord Jesus. They answer for us the question, what is the church for? God is giving us his reasons, if you like, for leaving his people on the earth. He's telling us the top priority for life in this world. And as we listen into Jesus' teaching, if you've got it in front of you, perhaps you can turn back to the end of Matthew chapter 28. I think we're in no doubt, as we listen to Jesus, what our top priority is. If you look right to the middle of verses 18, 19, 20, verse 19... Jesus says that our top priority as Christians is to make disciples of Jesus Christ. That's the single command in verse 19. It is, he says, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. Uh, There are the 11 then. They're walking along this road. They're just wondering what their meeting with Jesus is going to be about. He's told them, verse 16, that they must meet him at a mountain. James pipes up, hey guys, do you remember that incredible sermon on a mountain? And Peter says, yeah, and and when he was transfigured, that that was on a mountain as well. Matthew adds, and of course the, the Ten Commandments, the whole Sinai thing, that was a mountain. And it's just dawning on them that mountains have a, a big feature in God's plans for the world. So why is Jesus called them to a mountain for now? This is a big moment. So they walk a bit quicker. They eventually arrive. Verse 17, have a look down. When they saw him, they worshipped him. 
So much has happened. So big is this moment. There's others around with them as well. And it looks like some of those others, they, they doubted, it says. It means really to hesitate. And no doubt there's too much to take in. They can't process everything that's happened in the last few days. I just think that detail is brilliantly helpful. Some doubt it. Doesn't it remind us that this is a real thing? It's a historical event. If you'd made it up, you'd never have put that some doubt it. And then Jesus speaks to them. And his main command to these loyal few standing in front of him is make disciples of all nations. And the surrounding verbs in verse 19 and 20, they unpack what it's going to mean to do that. What will that involve? Um, Let's just look briefly at them. Verse 19 begins, therefore go. It involves going. Followers of Jesus need to go out from themselves in order to make disciples. To reach all nations, they're going to need to travel. It's going to involve, verse 19, baptizing. Baptism is that brilliant sign that Jesus gives to mark a person as joined to him. It's a sign, we're going to have it at 11.15, that someone's been cleansed from sin. That's the, the sign of baptism. It's a sign of new life being given. And here it's in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That means it's in relationship with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We're under their lordship. And we're actually going to think a bit more about baptism later in the term. Uh, If you're a Christian this morning and you haven't yet been baptized, there's going to be an opportunity in November on a particular Sunday. We're going to explain in due course how that'll be and how to work out, but do look out for the details. Baptism is a part of being made a disciple of Jesus. And then the third part, verse 20, teaching. Uh, The word disciple simply means one who learns. I think it's a really helpful way to think of being a Christian. You are one who learns from Jesus, which implies all sorts of things about what will be important to us. There's no such thing, therefore, as a know-it-all Christian. Just occasionally you meet Christians and there's a sense of, well, you can't tell them anything new. No, this is teaching. And however mature a believer, however long a believer, everybody wears L plates because we're learners. And we're not just taught information. Verse 20, if you look at it again, it's teaching them to obey everything I've commanded. So all that is learnt is to affect how the disciple lives. I hope we're Christians who are constantly working out their obedience to Jesus, thinking through where they need to stop doing things, where they need to start doing things in order to obey his teaching. That is all about a disciple. Now, if you're one of the 11, uh, you're hearing this for the first time, the chances are you're pretty wobbly and perhaps you're a bit fearful at this moment. You're confused, you're anxious about the future. Jesus' words are hardly going to calm your nerves. It's job enough to go baptize and teach. Perhaps, though, what stuns you most is to whom you're to go. Make disciples, Jesus says, of all nations. Don't rule out any kind of person from any kind of people group. This is a a commission with with a staggering scope. If you've been here over um, the summer months, you'll know we've been looking at some chapters of the book of Genesis Uh, a book all about the faithfulness of God and how he's always true to his promises. One of those promises, perhaps one of the most famous, comes in chapter 12 to Abraham. Abraham is told he will be a blessing to all nations, all peoples, all families of the earth. Matthew, when he begins his gospel, describes Jesus as a son of Abraham. In Jesus, that promise is going to be fulfilled. And at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, you see how it is going to be fulfilled. All nations are going to be blessed as they become disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. So as Muhammad walks up to the entrance of church, as he almost did this week, and say he wants to be blessed by God, he needs to be encouraged to become a disciple of the Lord Jesus As Joan wants the blessing of God in her life, in her old age, she needs to be encouraged to keep being a disciple of the Lord Jesus. The commission here is to go to every person of every religion 
in every continent and make them disciples of Jesus Christ. It is staggering in its scope. And just as you start talking about people of other religions, it starts too, doesn't it, to stand staggering in its arrogance. Make disciples of absolutely everyone? Why on earth should we do that? Well, the answer is in verse 18. It's because of the absolute authority of Jesus Christ. The first word of 19, therefore, reminds us that the arrogant-sounding words uh, follow something. They follow what says in verse 18. So just look down. Jesus comes to them, and this is the first thing he says. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That is why you're to go and make disciples of all nations. And if you wonder why Jesus has this authority, the reason is because of what has just happened in Matthew chapter 28. That is, he's been raised from the dead by God. If you're new to the Christian faith, that's the most helpful place to begin, I suggest, in working out whether it is true. Start with the resurrection of Jesus. Do you think he rose from the dead or not? Now, we see Jesus' authority, don't we, throughout the Gospels, because he does things, he He says things which are incredible. But the resurrection of Jesus, if you like, is a a new public demonstration. It is a worldwide declaration of his authority. So we think of world summits in Newport coming to an end as they claim quite a lot of authority for how to work out the world. And here Jesus says, all authority has actually been given to me. There's no policeman politician or president who has more authority. There's no policeman, politician or president who is not under the authority of Jesus. Your boss, your client, that colleague are under the authority of Jesus. Your family, your neighbor, those friends, they are under the authority of Jesus as well. You've never met a human being who is not under the authority of Jesus Christ. Sometimes we talk about a Christian and we define them, don't we? And we say, well, yes, a Christian is someone over whom Jesus is Lord. Well, that's a little bit sloppy in a way. Not quite, because Jesus is Lord over people who are not Christians as well. That's why we go and make disciples of them. It means, you see, the church is not sent out in order to conquer the world somehow. The church goes out in the name of the one who's already done the conquering. The Christian church isn't trying to sort of desperately establish Jesus as king. They're declaring that he's already king. And it's not that we have to sort of create some reality where Jesus rules against the run of play. No, we are urging people to live in line with the reality that he's already ruling. So if Jesus has this kind of authority over all nations, yes, of course make disciples of all nations. That just follows on. So there's Peter, James, and John, Matthew, and all the others. They're looking around at each other, wondering how on earth is this going to be possible? How do we do this? And the answer in verse 20 is their reassurance. It's the permanent presence of this same authoritative Lord Jesus. It's the glorious promise. And uh, we often claim it, don't we? Perhaps uh, detached from the commission. Verse 20 teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and behold, and surely, I am with you always to the very end of the age. I think I always used to think that last phrase of Jesus was a sort of, oh, and by the way, a PS, an afterthought. Off you go on an enormous adventure, and by the way, here's an apple for your journey. In fact, it's the whole climax of the commission. Off you go on this enormous adventure, and best of all, I'm going to drive. First 11 disciples, they must have needed this assurance, don't you think? They're looking around at the rest of the group. There's foot in mouth Peter, fat lot of good he's going to be. There's hesitating Thomas, tax collecting Matthew. There's just a football team's worth of you and a few stragglers on. And you lot are to take this news to the whole wide world. And Jesus expects there to be reassured by his promise. He's going to be with them literally all of every day until the end and if it's good enough for them it's certainly good enough for you and me who are in much greater number 
the one with all authority, is permanently with his people. Now, for many of us here, I'm very aware this Great Commission is very familiar. And these ingredients of the authority of Jesus, the instruction itself, the comfort that he gives, we're very familiar with all those things. And just for our last few minutes, I want, therefore, to try and help us avoid perhaps thinking we know it, but not quite knowing it, or worse still, thinking we're obeying it, but possibly not quite obeying it. Just for the last few minutes, can we think about what the top priority is not? What this priority is not is not just for some Christians. If you've been to South Wales, you'll be aware of the uh, tolls, possibly, depending where you entered Wales, at the Severn Bridge. And uh, you're driving along the motorway and it expands to lots of lanes, each one of the lanes approaching a little booth where you pay your toll money. And above the lanes are instructions, but they're not all the same instructions. So a, a sort of normal person would go through one of the many middle lanes, that's where you pay your money to a real live person who's sitting in a booth who can give you some change. There are some very special lanes for people who have the exact money. They're slightly smarmy people, and they've probably had the money ready since the beginning of the week. <laughs> and there are some lanes, aren't there, for the oversized lorries. They're not going to fit anywhere else. They have a particular lane. Different instructions, different people, different lanes. We can think the Great Commission is the instruction for those in the special lane. Uh, particular Christians, well, they really should go and make disciples. Normal Christians, we plod along as you were. That's fine. Perhaps we think it was just for the 11. Or we think, no, it's for overseas mission partners. They're obviously reaching the nations. If we keep praying and giving money to them, well, we're doing the Great Commission as well. Or it's the keen members of the church because, well, just, they just like that sort of thing. It is clear, I think, in Jesus' words that they are for all subsequent generations of believers, all disciples, all members of all churches. Um, Just notice why I think that is. Jesus says that new disciples are to be taught to obey everything that he commands. Here is something he commands. To go and make disciples is something he is telling people to obey. So a new disciple is themselves to go and make disciples of others. The command itself is continuing down the generations. People are to obey what he has said. But also this promise at the end, verse 20, the amazing promise of Jesus' presence, that is until the end of the age. That is when Jesus returns. Jesus is assuming evidently that he speaks to every generation of Christians until the end. Making disciples of Jesus is for all disciples of Jesus. It is written, if you like, across every toll booth, whichever lane you are in. So it's not just in the faraway nations. Making disciples goes on in our homes, in our offices, in our streets, in our schools, in our churches. As Jesus sees it, there's no such thing as a disciple who is not into making disciples of others. Our commissioning prayer really was for all of us that each person here who is a Christian would make Christ known in truth and love, both to others and to the world. Put it another way, a disciple is by definition a disciple maker. And a disciple maker is one who speaks to others about God, who speaks to God about others, that is who prays. On the notice sheet, as you take it home, you'll see there's a little paragraph there inviting anyone who wants to pray for our Sunday gatherings to join us in that room there at 10 past 9, 10 past 6, because we're praying for the work of disciple-making to go on. It doesn't mean, do you see, that you need a PhD in theology to do this. It doesn't mean that you need a perfect life. You're only qualified if you haven't made any mistakes. We simply need to be disciples in order to make disciples. That is, simply need to be learning from Jesus ourselves. And if I'm learning from Jesus myself, I have something about Jesus 
to pass on to someone else. I am a disciple maker. The priority of making disciples is not just for some Christians. It is for all Christians. And then just finally, this priority of Jesus is not just to be like Jesus. There's a very prominent Christian leader of this century who said, our mission is to be one of service. We're sent into the world, like Jesus, to serve. And so surely the purpose of the church is to love people like Jesus loves people, to serve people like Jesus serves people. Of course it is true that Jesus served in many ways. He met people's real needs. It's true that Christians are to be serving and loving like Jesus, living in that way too. But actually whenever Jesus serves people, perhaps by healing or driving out a demon or something like that, it is to make clear that he's the saviour king. His purpose was to serve in an ultimate way. As he explains in the middle of Mark's gospel, he comes to give his life as a ransom for many. That is his service. And of course, you and I cannot repeat that unique service of dying for sin. We're not to repeat what he's done. If you like, we're to report what he's done. How can we die for sin as he did? Now, just thinking about this a little bit more, I think um, Christchurch has many very, very significant strengths. Uh, I think uh, we are a church who um, very often is very welcoming. And I say that having come back from visited other churches while being away. I think Christchurch is a, a church that is um, very friendly, tied up with welcoming. We go out of our way to look after people we don't know perhaps so well. I think home groups can know a great deal of closeness of relationship. I think many of our meetings... Many of our meetings, not all our meetings, run smoothly. We get by. We get to the end. It hasn't been a disaster. But is it possible that we sometimes make those good things the main thing when they're not? Is it possible that the things which are the means to a goal become the goal itself? Please don't mishear me. To be welcoming, to be friendly, to be rich in relationship with one another, for meetings to run smoothly are very, very important parts of, of church life. But not as ends in themselves. They are important so that the business of disciple making can go on. Questions are not, did Sunday go smoothly? Did people turn up to that connection event? Are we doing what normally happens so there's a sense that all is well? The question is, are disciples of Jesus being made and grown? Were learners of Jesus seeking to pass on something else, something about Jesus, to someone else? That is our measure of what goes on. That doesn't just happen because there are some meetings available and there are some people to turn up to them. Disciple making is an intentional activity. It's for all believers to be involved in. Uh, there's a story of a lifeboat station. You may know it. A very, very good lifeboat station. And uh, the crew were a great bunch of people. They were very well equipped. They had a top of the range lifeboat, they had all the technical equipment needed. They kept it clean, tidy. And it all worked very well, all the time, all operational, everything serviced perfectly. They themselves were very well trained. They knew their stuff. They could use everything with great skill. Uh, the station itself was immaculate all the time. And they were very well known because they had lots of visitors each year who loved looking around. It was a very popular place to go. They got quite a name for themselves, being the best run station, in fact, in the country. So much so that they became more and more concerned about being a showcase lifeboat station and less and less concerned about launching to rescue people. They had one meeting of members and it was even suggested that they don't launch again because it was making everything rather untidy and messy and not quite so good for people looking around. The focus was on being well-equipped and well-trained and well-known but they'd stopped rescuing because that would get in the way. 
It's a nonsense thought, and may God preserve us from the same. Jesus is clear. Our purpose and priority is making disciples of Jesus Christ. And is the reason we're not doing that because we've forgotten his authority? Or have we forgotten his presence with us? Let me pray for us. All authority has been given to me, says Jesus. Therefore, go and make disciples. Lord Jesus, we do praise you that you are risen from the dead and that you are now publicly uh, the ruler of all, the Lord of the universe. We do praise you too for your wonderful presence with us by your spirit that as that Lord of the universe, you even dwell in the hearts of your people and are with them all the time till the very end of the age. And we ask you would imprint upon us more and more those wonderful truths that we might be those who continue and to do even better what you've asked us to do in making disciples of yours. We ask it for your namesake. Amen.